Salutations! Welcome to Pod Mortem. I'm Travis Hunter, joined as always by my co host, my sister, and my brother in law. Hi, I'm Renee Hunter Vasquez. Hi, I'm John Paul Vasquez. This week, we're broadcasting live from the attic of the Cotton House discussing the 1987 supernatural horror classic, Hellraiser. This film was written and directed by Clive Barker based on his novella, The Hellbound Heart, which was released the year prior. After disappointment with previous adaptations of his work, Hellraiser marked the directorial debut for Barker and was released to box office success despite mixed critical reception. The film would go on to spawn a franchise with nine sequels of varying quality, all featuring the iconic leader of the Cenobites, who would come to be known as Pinhead. This film was suggested to us by friend of the show, Macy McDonald. Thank you so much for your support of the show and the suggestion. So, Hellraiser, what were your first impressions on the film? I know that there's like a running theme about us watching movies too young. Mm -hmm. This is one that we did not watch. No, not at all. (laughs) Finally. I don't remember when we saw this the first time. uh, Neither do I. But we were talking earlier. It's one of those films that for some reason doesn't really get brought up. Right. I, I honestly can't remember the first time I saw it. It's underrated, I guess, in a weird mm-hmm. way. Um, I really enjoyed revisiting it, though. Mm-hmm. I feel like, obviously, if you do watch this when you're young, there's shit that you're just not going to understand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nor should you. Um, but I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> I did watch this as a kid. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, yeah. yeah. I'm not. But <laughs> I I do rem- I, I do remember that I didn't understand shit that was going on. Mm-hmm. Like I was a kid kid and I didn't I remember liking it because of like I guess them supposed to, you know to I mean their character and the, you know everything that was going on in the movie. Mm-hmm. But like all the like adult stuff, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. You know I, mean? I was <laughs> like, "Oh, this is really scary." <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. Was, yeah. And it is. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I do I do like this movie and I do think that not enough people talk about it. But yeah, I I hadn't watched any of the sequels or this movie in a long time until we just did for the show. Uh-huh. But like you said earlier, I know hmm. some of them aren't the best of quality, <laughs> yeah. but it started to get to the point, and I know I'm not wrong in saying this. I think they were just making the movies to maintain the rights to Hellraiser. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm sure. They're like, if we don't fucking make a movie in our backyard this weekend, yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> we're losing it. But no, I, I agree with both of you. The crazy thing to me is the climate in which this movie came out. Like, it was the era of the mm-hmm. slasher. Yeah. You know, it was nearing the end. Right. right. In all fairness, because there were a ton of sequels around this time, 1987. Mm-hmm. Right. But. I think that this movie was trying to offer more than that. Right. I think that it does. Yeah. But it gets, if it's mentioned at all, it Mm -hmm. gets lumped in. And I don't feel like it's, I don't, I don't really know how to explain it. I kind of feel like it's its own genre almost, if that makes sense. It does because you do see iconic uh, villains, they all get lumped in together. Right. Yeah. Right. People talk about, you know, Leatherface and Pinhead and Michael Myers and, and yeah. Jason. And you're like, like hold, hold on. Not, yeah, hold <laughs> not on. so much. Yeah, one of these is not like the yeah. other. Yeah, exactly. Um, what is very interesting to me is that Clive Barker, who wrote the novella, also wrote and directed the film. That's not super common. Yeah. And I did read that it was because they had made films based on two of his previous works, Rawhead Rex and Underworld. He wrote the script for Underworld and he was like, that was not, oh, <laughs> that didn't cut it. He's like, I'm just going to do all of it. This yeah. Time. <laughs> and he like, he wrote this novella as almost like, almost like how they did Lee Winnell and James Wan and Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, almost yeah. like a proof of concept. Right, right. Right. This novel was that for this film. All right. I saw in that video you, you sent us right. in Praise of Shadows, it was always intended to be a feature film. Right. Yeah. And so it finally gets picked up, financed by New World Pictures. And it's funny because we were just talking about Rod. Roger Corman with Scream 3. I know. Yeah, Yeah, I was thinking that too. Right? This is his company. Right, right. And so, I mean, you obviously have a very low budget and what they do with it is incredible. No, yeah. The practical effects in this movie. It's unbelievable. And that's even more. I'm like, why is this not in the conversation? Exactly, exactly. Because it rivals some Cronenberg. It rivals, not to the extent, but you think of the thing. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, you yeah. know, 
because it's incredible the stuff that they were able to Hell do. Yeah. yeah. I was watching it earlier and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> 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 we're doing this shit. But it's just, it's very impressive. And I think the only thing for me is that the novel seems to put a lot of emphasis on pain and pleasure. Mm -hmm. This movie seems to put more of the emphasis on the pain aspect of it. I agree. Well, I mean, it depends on who you ask. (laughs) (laughs) Now, before we tear this film's soul apart, we would like to issue a warning for spoilers. Podmortem is a very in-depth podcast, and in thoroughly discussing horror films, we have no choice but to spoil a thing or two. If you don't wish to be spoiled, please go watch the film, then come back and enjoy the show. If you've already seen the film or don't care about spoilers, let's solve the puzzle. So the film opens with ominous music as we run through the opening credits, including Clive Barker's Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he was very pleased He's to like, see. He's like, me, Yes, me. I did it. <laughs> I know it's definitely not. Because I think it was Christopher Young that did the music, but I really got some Danny Elfman vibes from this. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. So I wasn't yeah, alone. No, I'm like this is Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> of all the films. I was gonna say I like that. That's the one you felt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the credits give way to a tight shot of a nifty looking box about the size of a Rubik's cube, with what looks like a button in the center, surrounded by brass accents. Uh, are we getting this? <laughs> is that fair? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But we pull back to reveal it's sitting on a table with two men on either side. One is a merchant, and he asks Frank Cotton, played by Sean Chapman, what his pleasure is. Frank tells him, the box. (laughs) It's very plain. Straight up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Then he puts a stack of cash on the table, but then he adds more cash to the stack, which only sweetens the deal, and the transaction's done. He should have spent some of that cash on a manicure, because... (laughs) His nails were fucked up. My question is like, the dude didn't say, oh, it'll be more cash, please. <laughs> so <laughs> like, take everything I have. Yeah. These negotiation skills are dog shit. <laughs> but yeah. Did he dig through shit to find that cash? <laughs> His nails were filthy. <laughs> I noticed that. I was like, geez. <laughs> were bad. But Frank snags the box and bails as the merchant says, it's yours. It always was. Terrifying. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's chilling. It's like uh, the caretaker in The Shining. Yeah. <laughs> I, you don't want to hear that. Nothing. I don't like destiny being bad things. No. But then we see Frank seated shirtless in a dark attic surrounded by candles. Just cut right to it. <laughs> oh, I mean. He had plans. <laughs> <laughs> he knew what he wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> there is a cool shot, though. It's this overhead of him, and he's like neatly framed in the right. center. I was like, man, for a first time director, there's some pretty neat. Yeah. He's got an eye. Yeah. But he holds the box in his hands, finally pressing the button in the center. It starts to open up and we hear the walls around him begin to creak as blue light comes through the windows. He turns a piece of the box, pushing it in like a puzzle. Very admittedly poorly rendered blue lightning. <laughs> <laughs> shoots out of the box and we see hooks rip into Frank's flesh as he screams. Now you got a lawsuit on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> we get an exterior shot of the house that he's doing this ritual in, followed by shots inside the house showing old food in the kitchen with flies buzzing around it, as well as a cockroach on his bed checking out some kind of pornographic figurine. <laughs> the roach is like, shit, you got this, man? Yeah. What the hell, I just Frank? came for the food, but... <laughs> But when we return to the attic, we see dozens of chains are suspended from the ceiling, along with spinning pillars adorned with random body parts. The floor is also covered in blood and guts and bones, and it's made apparent that Frank has been torn apart. Right. He was not ready for that jelly. I don't (laughs) know (laughs) what he thought was going to happen with that box. I mean, you kind of get a better idea if you read the novella. Mm -hmm. Honestly, you can just listen to it on YouTube. Um, It's like two and a half hours. But here it's just like, all right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the thing is, since you're bringing up the novella in the novella, they kind of get Frank's consent to do this. Well, yeah. They're like, we're going to fuck you up. (laughs) (laughs) Are you sure? And he's like, oh, yeah. Uh, He didn't understand. No, he was Kool-Aid man in the novel. But here, (laughs) shit just goes south. But we see two figures move through the chains one of them digging through the gore to piece Frank's face back together like a puzzle piece on the floor. It looked cool. Oh, it looked yeah. good. But as the figure rises, we see that it's the lead Cenobite, also known as Pinhead, played by Doug Bradley. He picks up the puzzle box and puts it back together. 
As blue light enters the box, we see the room is returned to its pre-Frank, pre-said factory condition. (laughs) (laughs) So, to my understanding, through the research, the box buying took place in Morocco, but the rest of the film takes place in England. Right. So he patiently waited until he got back to his house to yeah he's like i'm not gonna open this on the plane <laughs> what that whole sex dungeon came out he couldn't open that on the plane <laughs> no they needed the room yeah <laughs> but the the weird thing according to imdb is that the studio thought the film would be more marketable if it took place in the united states so you'll notice several of the english actors including frank mm-hmm. have been overdubbed by americans okay that makes a lot more sense yeah because it does the dubbing is for me it was distracting mm-hmm. yeah I was like, I that remember. is not your voice like i was like am i going crazy <laughs> <laughs> i remember you saying something about that. I was like i feel like i'm i'm seeing this right no, and it's like the thing is okay here's what i don't get it's not that it's English actors will not allow you to market it in the U.S. Like, there's right. no no. What's that the connection doesn't make here? Any yeah. sense. There's several famous. Like, I'm just so confused because the That's other thing, weird. some people get to keep their English accent. Yeah, yeah. Not Frank. No, no. <laughs> clearly not Frank. Well, I think the whole point is that. Well, we'll get into it. Okay. We'll get into it in a minute. Fair enough. Also, though, I read that Clive Barker hates the name Pinhead. And he refers to the character as the Hell Priest. Which is much more fitting. If I if I had to pick a title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but some indistinct time later, the camera swoops down the staircase to the front door where married couple Julia Cotton, played by Claire Higgins, and Larry Cotton, played by Andrew Robinson, are bickering over a stubborn lock on the front door. When they finally get inside, Julia complains that it smells damp. <laughs> When that happened, I was like, she's not going to like this house at all. She hasn't even seen the kitchen she's already- yet. <laughs> oh, God, the kitchen. <laughs> but Larry tells her that it's been empty for a while now, but they'll get it feeling like home soon enough. Through conversation, we learn Larry hasn't been here in 10 years. As it turns out, Frank is his brother. And after their mother passed away, Larry could never get him to agree to sell the home. And I guess what I was going to say a second ago, but we hadn't met larry yet Uh Um, i guess him being american and his wife being british and they're moving to england right they are in the story but i guess this is some this is uh san diego okay (laughs) what no i don't know where it is because they don't want it to be england but it looks just like england his his wife is british he's american and they're moving to england where his wife grew up i guess yeah they even have a line in a bit where they say that you're on your home turf he says to her yeah yeah uh, yeah, I, that's what was confusing. I was like, but he says, yeah, that line, that, and I was like, so I y'all should have taken that out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I guess them being brothers is why they would overdub his accent. I'd rather just one brother be British. Than it can yeah. happen. <laughs> be dubbed. I guarantee it's happened before. And then I bet when they heard that home turf line, the producers were like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> But they head into a room and switch on a light to reveal some kind of freaky shrine along with distorted music on a record. Larry assures Julia that he's not into this shit and that it'll all be trashed in a bit. He says they should let their daughter see the place before they clean it up, though, because she'd love it. I'm like, what's she into? <laughs> <laughs> but that inspires kind of a mini argument where we see that this marriage is pretty strained, but it seems like moving into this house will be a bit of a course correction to try and put things on the mend. Right. Larry asks what the argument is even about, and Julia says that there isn't one before crushing her cigarette on the floor. She lit it to drop it and smash it on the floor. My thing is, you know, no need to add to the mess, but go off, I guess. I mean, <laughs> shit. Can we clean it up yeah. first? <laughs> I just figured, I was like, do you think she likes the house? I guess. <laughs> She's like, fuck this place. If, it's, if you were just throwing trash yeah. everywhere, I guess not. But Julia sees a statue of Jesus in the window on the staircase and kind of sneers at it for some reason. <laughs> As if she didn't look villainous enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're setting the stage here very early yeah. on. She's like, <laughs> like hisses at it. <laughs> but <laughs> Larry hears flies buzzing and heads into the kitchen. Once there, he finds a plate full of maggots and cockroaches coexisting on a moldy old banana. I yeah. I, uh, it could so, be a sausage. I don't think so that's the point. So we're selling the house, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kitchen will never be clean enough no. again. Well, we're at least throwing the plate away. <laughs> yeah. Is this really what happens if food is just left like that? Like, where all the fuck do these bugs come from? I think, do they just sniff it out? 
Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I think there's a sausage <laughs> yeah. in that house. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Unattended. I did read that, just like we talked about on the Creep Show episode, I know that's going back in some time. Yeah. All these cockroaches and maggots were treated like actors. And oh, God. <laughs> there was a person <laughs> in charge of wrangling them, and they couldn't be um, opposite genders or else they would start to mate, and then it would just be an infestation. Well, I feel like ah. maybe mating would be appropriate for the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly. Get them off each other. <laughs> They're like, no, film that. <laughs> But Julia frantically calls out to Larry, who runs upstairs asking where she is. She then very like, calmly says, in here. Yeah. <laughs> I was Aren't like, I thought you, you were just panic? freaking out. <laughs> I'm going to go get some cigarettes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but they find Frank's very rudimentary bedroom, and she asks if it could be squatters. <laughs> Larry picks up that pornographic figurine from earlier that the cockroach was enjoying, and he chuckles to himself and just says... Frank. It, that made me laugh because he's like Frank and his little fuck statues. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he just picked it up and was like, nah, yeah. this is Frank shit. If we know one thing about Frank. <laughs> <that's fine>. <laughs> <laughs> but he says he must have been here, probably making one of his famous getaways. So again, to me, I feel like if somebody if he left home, say like 18, and he's been living in England ever since. Maybe he, he would might take have on. developed an actor. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But now let's just ruin this actor's yeah. life. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. But the phone rings and Larry's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> He's so upset by the phone. Yeah. You've never heard a phone ring? <laughs> Apparently not. But he heads downstairs to answer it. Julia drops her purse on Frank's bed. Downstairs, Larry answers the phone and it's his daughter, Kirsty, played by Ashley Lawrence in her debut role. Hmm. <laughs> I didn't know that. This is actually a big departure from the novella. Right, because Kirsty, Kirsty. Either way. How, however we want to say it. Um, <laughs> in the novella, she was just a friend who had the hots for Larry. Mm -hmm. So she's just like, fuck Julia. Because Julia is like this beautiful <laughs> woman and Larry is like, it's not tense like this. Like right. Larry is infatuated with mm. his wife and Kirsty. Kirsty is right. like fuck her. Like she's in love with Larry. Right. I feel like this makes a lot more sense. Her being his daughter, right, right? Because you still get the tension between her and her stepmom. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I feel like it. It makes more sense. I think it works better, not just because of a line that comes up later, uh -huh. but it's very much an interesting way to look at that tension between her mm -hmm. and Julia instead of it just being like, well, I am in love with that dude and you're with that dude. So fuck you. Yeah. Exactly. It's, yeah. It's it a makes a lot more thing. sense. But Kirsty tells him that she's found a room and she won't be staying with them. Like he thought he tells her that she'd like the house and she tells him that he would like her room. What part of that house would she like? <laughs> the maggots. <laughs> there you go. Love yeah. <laughs> she's trying to be an entomologist. So this <laughs> <Okay>. is, <laughs> so she would love it. Yes. But she says that maybe she'll see the house in a couple of days after she gets a job and tells him to trust her a little when he calls this a gesture. Hmm. I think to me, this is like her, her maybe ha having a history of taking digs at the stepmom. Right. Uh, so he's like, this is okay, just another yeah. fucking whatever. But back upstairs, Julia picks up a tin filled with pictures of Frank, just making it sweet with a variety of women. Frank's a free. Yeah. yeah, he's, you know, living his life. But she takes the last picture in the pile, which we don't get to see, and stashes it in her coat, putting the rest back in the tin. She heads downstairs to meet Larry, who just got off the phone with Kirsty. He's like, so? And she reluctantly agrees to give it a shot, and he says that they'll move in on Sunday. I feel like that was a very quick decision. She didn't even look in the whole house. No. Yeah. And those maggots better be putting in on some bills. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. They're actually subletting. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> But that Sunday, Larry and a couple of moving men fail miserably getting a bed upstairs and just take a break on the staircase. When moving man two, that's his name, asks for a beer, <laughs> Julia tells him there's some in the fridge. After no one moves to get it for some reason, Larry offers, sarcastically saying that he has nothing better to do. Julia heads upstairs, stopping for a moment, then proceeding up as moving man one and two peek up the staircase. I wasn't sure if they were checking her out or waiting for her to leave so they could talk shit about her I've, not getting yeah. the beer for them. I think they were checking her out. But like, it's funny because this whole scene, they're in the background like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is this their marriage? God damn. That's what I thought that too, that they were checking her yeah, out. Yeah, that's something. how I took it. Well, with what comes in a second, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> 
but in the next scene, we see Kirsty walking alongside the docks, and we get some nice shots of the water as she's taking in her surroundings. She finally arrives at the new house, surveying some of Frank's religious statues that I guess are out for the trash, before heading inside. She pushes past the bed that's still blocking the stairwell, and the moving men kind of hit on her a little bit. Yeah. And then she goes and she greets her father with a hug. Larry tosses the movers a six pack, which is very generous. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I thought they said a beer. Yeah. Did you say eight beers? <laughs> <laughs> but he asks Kirsty what she thinks of the house. After she remarks that it's big and that she does like it, he tells her that Julia is upstairs, but to go easy on her. So again, really planting those seeds. Yeah. yeah. But she reluctantly agrees to go easy on her before heading to the kitchen to make herself some coffee. Thankfully, the kitchen has been cleaned. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, just ask the maggots where the machine is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, it's third from the, yeah. <laughs> but the movers ask if Kirsty is his daughter. And when he says yes, they say that she has her mother's looks. Larry bluntly says her mother's dead. Yeah, I don't. You don't need to do that. <laughs> that necessary. <laughs> I mean, stepmom confirmed. Right. So we're certain. Right. But holy shit, he could have handled that better. Yeah, he's probably just trying to be an asshole because they were. They're like, really, were you hitting on her? Hitting yeah. on, yeah. Yeah. But upstairs, we finally see the photo that Julia swiped. It's just a photo of a woman holding Frank. But I mean, I say just because the other ones were pretty graphic. Yeah. But it's a sincere, like almost like they were together. Right. So naturally, she rips the photo in half. <laughs> <laughs> no, she rips the woman out of the photo. Yeah. True. And leaving only Frank. The photo tearing coincides with Kirsty trying to get the faucet going in the kitchen, and as the photo is ripped, water sprays out at Kirsty. I'm not sure how that's related, but <laughs> <laughs> it happened. Like everything's reaching a crescendo at the same time. <laughs> but we're then treated to a flashback of Julia answering the door to see Frank standing outside in the pouring rain. Frank introduces himself as Frank, brother Frank. Is he like Brother Mazone from <laughs> <laughs> Weird? Yeah. But he says that he came for the wedding and she lets him inside. This is when I was like, oh, yeah, it's really dubbed. No, no yeah. yeah. It's real bad here. But Frank asks for a towel. And then we realize that in present day, Kirsty's the one actually asking for a towel. Julia snaps out of her memory, slipping the photo into her pocket and saying hello to her stepdaughter. She's like, Julia, were you fantasizing yeah. about my uncle? <laughs> no, quick. No, the towels are there. Just get out of here. Ask the maggots. <laughs> But Kirsty drives herself in the bathroom, telling her about the room that she's renting. When Julia doesn't answer, Kirsty steps out and we see that Julia's just gone. But we get these <laughs> weird shots of Julia above on the banister, just slowly sneaking into the attic, not responding to Kirsty at all. No. Yeah. But Kirsty's looking right up at her. <laughs> she's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> And Larry was telling her to go easy on Julia, but she's right. like just fucking, <laughs> just fucking Homer Simpsoning you. into the bushes back there, but whatever. But in the attic, Julia approaches the window and we're overtaken by the sound of whispers. In another memory, Frank holds a bottle of liquor asking if they should drink to wedded bliss. She tells him that she's very happy and he's like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but then he asks if she's going to let him kiss the bride. He seductively pops a finger in her mouth before basically slamming their faces together in a kiss. She's like, all right. Yeah, she's into it, though. He's got the Kavorka because the minute she opened the door, she was like, oh, Ooh. yeah. She's like, vows? What vows? Right. <laughs> I haven't said Larry? them yet. Yeah. But later she asks him, what about Larry? To which he brandishes a switchblade and says, forget him. He then cuts the strap of her gown and caresses her. <laughs> I read on IMDb that this scene was a lot more graphic in the previous oh yeah yeah um you'll have to excuse me but <laughs> <laughs> clive barker literally said that the producers had him switch out a switchblade for the sodomy oh. wow <laughs> wow is one way to put it yeah, yeah i was like oh yikes <laughs> <laughs> Real quick question, though. Yes. Is that a tattoo of a Pokemon on his back? Yeah, I think that was Charizard, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> After a moment of hesitation, she's all in on the infidelity. And we get these shots back and forth between the past and the present day of Frank and Julia literally doing the deed on her wedding dress. Yeah, which is from the novella. Yeah, so yeah, good show. But... Also of Larry aggressively trying to pull the bed up the stairs with the help of the movers. 
it all reaches a crescendo and just as Frank and Julia, you know, finish up, <laughs> Larry scrapes his hand bloody against an errant nail. I feel like this was such an interesting like personification of the pleasure pain mm-hmm. dichotomy that is very, this movie. Very, very right. smart. I was like I feel I think that was a really smart and interesting way to do that Mm -hmm. i didn't even catch that i was just like man things are going great (laughs) oh things aren't going great (laughs) you know not for larry but very very smart but upstairs julia cries remembering that she told frank that she would do anything he wanted anything just then larry busts through the attic door dripping blood onto the floorboards (laughs) julia does not care no no (laughs) larry though he refuses to look at the wound saying he's gonna faint and Julia looks at it, and he is bleeding fucking profusely. Yeah, yeah but the way he walks up to her is like really weird. Like it is. Like he's holding his hand out. Almost like, like why is he walking like that? It makes me think of the way a child would hold a wound to their yeah, mother. Yeah. Well, yeah. In you the know? in the novella, he said that he faints at the sight of blood, so he won't. He is just like, take care of this. Is it bad? I can't look. Like, yeah. You're like <laughs> a forty five year old yeah. man. <laughs> It makes me laugh, though, because she says he'll need stitches, and he's like, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I mean, that was a deep cut, but is that black mold in that room? Yes. Yeah, I mean, they got some shit to worry about yeah. more than, like, we'll take you to the hospital later, but yeah. <laughs> right now. Top priority. Yes. It just, he comes in, and he's bleeding, like, fucking crazy, and she's just like, whatever. <laughs> she did, she Stop couldn't Stop blowing less. my sex. <laughs> I even went into another room. Exactly. Leave me alone. I was disturbed last time, so I slunk away. <laughs> but we see the blood on the floor soak into the floorboards. Looks really cool. It does. I'm assuming it's kind of reverse photography like we talked about on Final Destination. Right. With the toilet water. But <laughs> it, it's, it looks cool. It still looks great. But we then dip down from the attic window to beneath the floorboards. We hear the sound of a heartbeat and we see a tiny heart pumping slowly. Julia brings Larry downstairs as Kirsty is coming up. She asks what happened, looking at her father's hand, but Julia says that he'll be all right and asks if she'll drive him to the hospital. I love that he hurt himself and the movers are just gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'm crazy, but I was surprised that he was helping the movers in the first place. True. That's typically... Yeah, I didn't, I didn't understand that either. I was like, you're paying them to move. Right. What? Just tip maybe them well. He, yeah. He's one of those guys that wants it done a certain way. Maybe. Or maybe it's a assertion. Because honestly, when you think about masculinity and whatnot, he kind of seems like he is chasing that. Yeah. So he's like, I can move a bed. Yeah. No. You know, because he's got. Look what happened to you, Larry. Exactly. You mm. cut your hand to ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> But the camera floats upstairs to the attic where the floorboards start to creak and move and, most importantly, ooze. Yeah. Yeah. Smoke bellows out as rats look on. But just as triumphant music begins to play, two limbs punch up from the ooze, which turn into arms, and we see a very rough, very slimy torso minus a head. We then see a brain begin to materialize, and the torso kind of just plugs itself into it. I thought this was really cool. Absolutely. It is amazingly disgusting in the yeah. best possible way mm-hmm. it is so gross and it looks so good yes <laughs> this is where i was very surprised i'm like you're sure the budget was only a million dollars yeah yeah they worked magic because that's incredible yeah through the slime we see fingers begin to develop as well as organs and muscles form around a rib cage that's when the rats are like we're getting the fuck out of here <laughs> <laughs> like we, we do not need to see this but we finally see it it's like something out of Dr. Vanneket's basement. It's a yeah. skinless upper body holding itself up and it lets out a scream, which they're just downstairs, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, nobody heard that? No. Apparently not. I think someone left the TV on. Right. Fine. <laughs> downstairs at dinner, Julia looks very distracted as Larry entertains their guests with a lively story about work. Kirsty is there too, stifling a laugh as Steve, her boyfriend, played by Robert Hines, pops a cigarette in and out of his mouth and smokes it. There's no way that's safe. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Not at all. In response to Larry's story, Evelyn, played by Gay Baines, remarks to her husband, doctors. And her husband, Bill, played by Kenneth Nelson, is like, oh, that's right, honey. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Your friends are a lot of fun. Yeah, uh... clearly. My thing was, aside from that just being kind of odd dialogue, 
You mean to tell me Larry's a doctor, but he couldn't handle the sight of blood? Oh, yeah, what? Maybe it's his blood. He's like, I can, you know, everybody else. Mm, but know. that sounds like a plot hole to me. Yeah. yeah, it's like if the exterminator had come by to fix the house, he's like, Oh, I can't do bugs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, what? You're gonna have to get someone else. Sidebar: There's also a person at the table whose character's name is Dinner Guest, and flushed out. A lot of people don't get names in this film. Yeah, like including some cinnabites that we'll get into yeah i'm just confused as to why he's literally at the table with everybody else having a name right <laughs> he's the only one i just felt bad for him but <laughs> steve fills Kirsty's drink more than necessary and she says that she won't be able to stand up and he says so lie down and larry looks at him like "Ooh!" i was gonna say yeah. right in front of her dad yeah. exactly yeah. i nice thought he'd going. be i thought he'd say something like can you not you know yeah. talk like, about oh, banging my daughter please <laughs> But at this point, Julia stands up saying she thinks she's going to go to bed. When Bill also says that he and Evelyn should hit the bricks, Larry tries to keep the party going, saying it's the, quote, night of the paper hat. Does anybody know what that means? No idea. Okay. Is that like when you get in trouble and then they put the dunce out on you? They're like, we're, we're getting Maybe. fucking yeah, stupid we're getting- tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, they should have said that so we all know what's going on. It's dunce night. Everybody knows that. Come on. Is that a thing in not England? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere but England. Yes. But Julia says her goodnights to everyone, including dinner guest. But <laughs> don't forget him. <laughs> can't. She just shares a look with Larry. Like she literally kisses Bill on the cheek. She it's kisses so Steve, weird. Yeah. And then she's just like, that'll do, pig. <laughs> <laughs> it's awkward. Yeah. But the party just continues downstairs as Julia heads upstairs in the dark. She hears creaking noises coming from the attic, so she turns on the light and puts her ear to the door. Loud whispers break out as she puts her hand on the knob, but they stop as soon as she opens the door. Those whispers were spitting. Yeah. <laughs> it was like four or five, six people. <laughs> they were going off. Mm-hmm. I want to know what they were saying. <laughs> but as she makes her way in, we hear the sound of a heartbeat. She stumbles upon the rats going to town on some of the body fluid that's been left. Yeah. And she's understandably repulsed by it. Just then, though, a skinless hand grabs her leg and she screams. She rushes for the door and opens it, but the skinless body, dragging its legs behind it, reaches the door first and shuts it. We see a ghoulish face, and it asks, Julia? And it tells her not to look at his face. (laughs) It's like, you don't have to tell me twice. (laughs) But you're right in front of me. Yeah. It's like, what am I? Do I look at the wall? (laughs) (laughs) He looks awful and fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You say awful in the best way. In the best possible way. But she asks who he is, and he just asks for help. Through her sobs, she asks once more who he is, and he finally mutters, Frank. She can't believe it, but he assures her that it's him. Sidebar, we already credited the actor that had been playing Frank before, but this character is called Frank the Monster, Okay, (laughs) and he's played by Oliver Smith. It checks out. Yeah. (laughs) I don't understand how nobody... I mean, I guess we see in a second some semblance of an explanation mm-hmm. but nobody hears shit downstairs Not at, all. at yeah. all like someone's screaming up there <laughs> <laughs> she was literally sobbing yes but frank tells her that larry's blood dripping on the floor brought him back to life again another change from the novella yeah cuz i mean <laughs> all the shit that we've said i'm like can i say that <laughs> in the novel he explains it that he knew he was <laughs> dying or something away mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. so he just forgive me jerks off onto the floor <laughs> and then the <laughs> i'm sorry the nicest way i could say it no the funniest thing about it is why did he know that would work <laughs> yeah i don't <laughs> or is he like it's one for the road i'm just so confused so everybody if you know you're about to die just <laughs> yeah. just in case just in case but the, you gotta leave some of that fluid behind the, and then maybe it'll mix with blood and then you'll come back on the off chance but <laughs> you the, never know the thing to me is that again not only him not knowing all that but that's the novel again putting more emphasis on the pleasure than the pain yes yeah because here he opens the box and they just rip his shit apart <laughs> yeah <laughs> there was no pleasure yeah. to speak of didn't even ask him but <laughs> anyway. sorry i i it's crude but somebody had to say it yeah because it is a marked difference and i guarantee the mpaa was like oh you can't <laughs> we're not you doing cannot that. do well, that that would be really weird uh, to yeah. do in the movie. <laughs> he's like hold on pinhead <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when she asks from where he's been brought back he just begs for her help again 
back downstairs, Kirsty stumbles away from the party and heads upstairs to the bathroom as the conversation continues in the attic. Frank tells Julia that the blood got him this far and that she has to heal him. As Kirsty leaves the bathroom, Julia is standing at the top of the steps, understandably shaken. Not much of a poker face on, the, on yeah. this one. I was like, be cool, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kirsty is immediately like, are you all right? <laughs> And she just doesn't answer again. I'm going to start doing that when somebody asks me something I don't want to answer. I'm just, just going to look at silently. them or slowly back away because <laughs> it works for her. Uh, because Kirstie's never like, what the fuck is wrong with her? <laughs> she just accepts it. But Frank waits in the doorway of the attic as Steve comes to retrieve Kirstie. She just says goodnight to Julia and heads downstairs and Frank closes the door. That night, we get a shot of a train speeding by before we're taken to an alley where we see Kirsty and Steve walking together. Steve asks why she isn't staying with Larry because there's plenty of room. And she says there is plenty of room for Julia. It's like, damn. Yikes. But unbeknownst to them, and this is the name in the credits, Derelict, played by Frank Baker, watches them. Classy. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something makes Kirsty turn around, though, and she makes eye contact with him. Kirsty and Steve head downstairs into the station, flirting a bit. The scene ends with them kissing as we zoom out deeper into the train station. Just to put it, Steve is not present in the novella. No, and I don't necessarily feel like he needed to be in the film. There's not yeah, a, you know? What I don't understand is why he's, he asked her, why didn't you stay at Larry's house? Is mm -hmm. that her dad? Yeah. So why wouldn't you just say that? That, that bothers you when characters <laughs> do that. Well, did Clive Barker forget that that was? Yeah, like, oh, that, shit. oh, I've changed it. I've never told my brother that. Are you going to stay at Bertha's house? Because it's like, <laughs> like can't just say your mom. Mother. Yeah, that's our mom. Yeah. Back at the house, Julia lies awake in bed with Larry fast asleep next to her. We finally get the payoff to Julia's memory from earlier as Frank clarifies that she'd do anything for him. She repeats anything he's like say word yeah, yeah. He's like, double check because i'm about to, I'm this is about to cash be... in on that <laughs> but we get this neat shot of present day skinless frank waiting in the attic barely being able to make out his features in the moonlight <laughs> the mice are looking at him like what the fuck is yeah <laughs> even they were scared yeah they're like we did not come here for this <laughs> but as frank eyes one of the rats for a midnight snack julia opens the door he asks you'll do it and she says, yes. Frank smiles, glad that he did not have to eat that rat. <laughs> Frank kind of looks like he took a walk down the cell block in Silence of the Lambs. If you're yeah. <laughs> picking up what I'm putting yeah. down. He, he's shiny. I'm like, was that on purpose? I, I don't know what it means. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Somebody almost died. <laughs> 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 took care of business. Yeah. So if she's willing to like help this skinless fucking whatever... <laughs> person or i don't even know if he's i mean i guess are you a person I, yeah, yeah still how long had that affair been going on see and that's the that's the weird thing is that they make it seem like this was a one-time thing yes. yeah yeah but, but she's dead set yeah, on yeah. This dude so much so that her finding his pictures was enough to her saying okay we'll live here no yeah we'll live that's here because true. he's been here yeah I... you got it you got it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it does come across that it was just the one time. But an affair yeah. would make her actions make more sense. Right. But that's yeah. not how it's presented at all. Mm -mm. But we then get an odd shot of a sweaty, pale-faced Kirsty walking into a bedroom. Feathers fill the air as she approaches a bed, which has two candles lit on either side. In the bed is a body beneath a blanket that slowly begins to soak with blood as we hear the sound of a baby crying. Soon enough, the entire bed is covered in blood. The body lurches up to reveal what appears to be Larry, or at least someone wearing his face as a mask. The fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I, what? I don't understand. Yeah, I was confused. Yeah. Do you think there should be a mask of Larry? <laughs> and what should he wear it? <laughs> but we then see Steve waking up on the floor of Kirsty's room. He looks over at Kirsty, who is clearly still living the nightmare. But the way he lurches up, you'd think it's it, like was it was his. his... I thought yeah. I had the exact same thought. I don't know why you wouldn't just start the scene with him already awake. Yeah, I, I thought that was weird, too. I was like, so is it his dream? Or yeah. Is it... <laughs> and you see her freaking out. You're like, oh, shit, no. No, yeah. He's like, we just I, had had crazy, I had the craziest dream about you and your dad. <laughs> <laughs> no, wake up, wake up. <laughs> 
But he does wake her up and she is just covered in sweat. She remembers her nightmare and because of it decides to call her father. He picks up at the house and tells her that he's all right. Actually, he says never better. And he tells her to sleep well. Upstairs, Julia lies awake in bed and we get a shot of Frank perched in the attic, <laughs> s- silhouetted against the window as some ooze drips off his knee. Specifically his knee. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's where it dripped. <laughs> They're going all in on him just being repulsive. Yeah. And he is. Mm -hmm. But Julia asks who it was on the phone, and Larry tells her that it was Kirsty and that she just had a bad dream. He heads back into the bedroom, and we tilt up to see Frank's slimy-ass body crouched down, holding onto the handrail, and he says, Kirsty. I'm like, (laughs) you need to hide. (laughs) Chill, Frank. Like, your fucking brother was right there. (laughs) But that morning, we see Julia leaving the house, looking up to Frank in the attic window. We then see her at a bar chatting up a random man. He flirts with her in an English accent. You're right. So he gets to keep his. Yeah. I mean, who could resist her with those earrings, though? (laughs) They were the size of her head. (laughs) Well, you got to accessorize, I guess. I don't know. But he asks if they can have a drink together. We see her bring him back to the house, and he tries to kiss her, but she isn't into it. He then just flat turns into an asshole. He's like, oh, so you're changing your mind now? But then yeah. he's like, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not how. No. <laughs> no. But she's like, let's go upstairs. Which to me, I was like, she was having second thoughts. And then he fucking showed his ass. And she's like, you know you what? what? <laughs> Fuck yeah. you. That's fine. I'll feed you to Frank. <laughs> <laughs> but she opens up the attic door, leading him inside. She shuts and locks the door behind her and tells him to take his jacket off, which he does. She returns the favor, taking hers off as he's taking his pants off. We see Frank waiting in the wings, watching a little bit longer than he needs to be, right? He's like, no, let's see where this goes. (laughs) He's a freak. We've established That's true. That is true. I hope he's not about to die (laughs) because... We talked earlier about Julia not having a poker face. No. She's... She's so suspicious. Yeah. I'd be like, you're going to kill me up there. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> he's so suspicious. I think that's a comment on dudes. Yeah. He's like, dude, I, I don't, don't care. care. <laughs> and he basically is. But when the man says that he needs to use the restroom before they get down to business, he heads for the door, but he realizes it's locked. <laughs> he's like, did you lock this thing? Yeah, but <laughs> even at this point, he's not like, that's strange. He's just asking. I have to pee. Yeah. He's like, it must be an accident, but... <laughs> With his back turned, Julia grabs a hammer and clocks him upside the head with it. She then smashes him in the mouth with it, and he begs for his life, but she hits him one more time. She takes his teeth out. Yes. Yeah, I thought that looked really cool. It It looked really great. According to IMDb, though, this was supposed to be even more gruesome than what we saw. And I think at one point, the hammer embedded in his forehead. Holy huh. shit. And she had to pull it out. Right. But of course, to avoid getting an X rating mm. from always our good friends, yeah. the MPAA. Yeah, we love them. Yeah, they had to cut it. I have a couple things here. Hmm. Um, Julia really does not seem to give a fuck that she no. just murdered this dude. Not completely. No. And. If I'm Julia, why do I have to kill him? Why can't I just get him up here and then you take care of it? Frank's weak. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I'm like, you saw you crawling with your legs a second ago. (laughs) So you're shutting doors, but you can't whack this dude. He was squatting on the stairs. That's true. So his knees are fine. (laughs) What is going on? I don't know. Maybe Maybe it's about power. Him being like, if I tell you to do something, will you do it? Maybe. Well, I mean, I guess. I would just, I wouldn't agree to all that. Maybe no. she was getting pleasure out of causing that guy pain. Maybe. Because she didn't give a yeah. shit. <laughs> no, and he was an asshole. Yeah, like, this like, is like fine. you said, when he, when he turned into a dick, she was like, never mind, yeah, let's I go I got upstairs. something for you. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. But Julia, covered in blood, drops the hammer and puts her back to the wall. Frank asks her again not to look at him. <laughs> I love how self-conscious he is. <laughs> He's like, I'm not my best. <laughs> I don't I don't have my face on. <laughs> but she obliges and leaves the room. Behind her, we see Frank crawl over to the man's body and grab him by the ankle. I didn't we we learn later on the process, but I was like, is he eating these people? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought yeah. right before, yeah. But Julia retreats to the bathroom, taking off her shirt, and before she washes the blood from her face, we get this very striking shot of her pale skin and blue eyes with her face covered in blood. Mm -hmm. This is the point that I'm like, okay, is she the protagonist? 
I feel like she is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, this is very intriguing to mm-hmm. me because she's doing some heinous shit. Yeah. But I do kind of have a little sympathy for her. Right. Should I? I don't know that I have sympathy other than her just being like love dumb. Right. But I don't know that I have sympathy because she is cheating on her husband right. with his brother and then also his brother's corpse and <laughs> also killing this man. But well, he I, was very forceful. He was, yeah. <laughs> I won't say that I feel necessarily sympathetic for her, but I will say badass character. Right. I find her very compelling. Right. Like what are you? What are you doing? <laughs> and the actress is fantastic. No, yeah, yeah she's great. Yeah. So every moment you're like, oh shit, she's going through it. Yeah. Well, he better be happy because she ruined that outfit. <laughs> she did. Like, she did. It better be worth it, yeah. dude. You better. You better feel real yeah. good, real fast. <laughs> <laughs> but she heads back into the attic to find the man's corpse, totally missing its skin. She scans the room, finally finding Frank, who steps out of the shadows, now able to walk. I'd be like, you can't be leaving scraps. No. Like, yeah. you need to take take care of all of this. Don't you need more bones? <laughs> take Don't care of everything. Bones. He's like, no, the skin does yeah, work. I, I, don't, I don't think he's Legos. <laughs> <laughs> but looking slightly closer to human, but also still very far from it, he tells her that it's making him whole again. He kind of looks like if he got a sniff of that fog from The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly because you see bone poking out. out. Exactly. But he tells her that every drop of blood puts more flesh on his bones, which is something they both want. He beckons her closer, but she's hesitant. I think she only really cares about him getting flesh on one bone. (laughs) (laughs) My God. But when she doesn't come to him, he walks to her, caressing her breast and touching her face. Just then, we hear Larry arriving home, calling out to her and whistling a jaunty tune. <laughs> He's having such a good day, yeah. man. <laughs> this is kind of when it changes a little bit for me, because I was sympathetic for her, but I'm like, Larry doesn't seem like a bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't. I think Larry is just boring. Yeah. I think she's just bored, and Frank is the... He's bad. You know what I mean? Poor Larry. Right. He didn't do anything wrong. No, but Julia half ass covers the man's corpse with her jacket, and carries it across the hall with ease, I guess. It's like a husk. Yeah. The skin wave. <laughs> skin know. and blood. Yeah. She slips into the bathroom as Larry heads upstairs. He knocks on the door, still in a great mood. She says she's feeling sick, though, and asks for a brandy, and he's on it. He was like, oh, what can I do? Yeah. I'm like, oh, you poor fucking Just guy, Just making me feel worse. But she looks at herself in the mirror, cleaning the blood from where Frank touched her face. She heads back into the attic and calls out to Frank. I'm like, dude, that brand is going to be coming real soon. Yeah. You better <laughs> make this quick. But Frank jumps out at her and tells her that he's starting to feel again. His nerves are coming back. In this shot, we see that his vascular system is returned because he is veiny as fuck. Yeah. Yes. But he tells her with one or two more bodies, he'll be good as new and they can run away together before, I guess, they start to follow, he says. She's like, who? And he tells her, the Cenobites. He says they need to get away before they realize that he slipped them. Larry calls out to Julia asking if she's all right. And she says she is. But she asks if he'll put on some music because Frank is speaking at full volume. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to be like, Julia, are you in there with Frank? (laughs) Is that my brother in there? Well, also, why did she change into a white shirt? And then go back in the room with Frank. Where his hands are just blood. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and he has a desire to touch her a lot. He's just a man made of blood. <laughs> but Frank makes a crack at full volume again about Larry being obedient. And she's like, you need to keep your voice down. <laughs> Chill. Yes. Yeah. And of course, Frank grabs her arm, ruining that shirt, and tells her that they belong to each other now, for better or worse. He says, like love only real which what does that mean i thought it was an interesting line i think that just tells us about frank i think it tells us about clive barker all right he's like (laughs) making a comment i guess about love being maybe commodified probably i don't know all right just thinking out loud valentine's day is a sham but (laughs) (laughs) we're suddenly jump scared by a screaming monkey in the pet shop that i guess kirsty works at now as some random karen with a parakeet complains to her she tells her that she's new here but she notices the derelict has wandered in she walks over to him noticing that he's stuck his hand in a tank full of crickets 
he pulls out his hand and it's just covered. <laughs> She's like, give those back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think that's the problem here. No. But instead of giving them back, he just munches down on them. They sound crunchy yeah. as hell. <laughs> Hey, as we've learned, I've eaten a cricket. They're not bad. They weren't bad. No, no. they weren't. They taste like sunflower seeds. Yeah. Now, these weren't just picked up from the ground. I want to make that clear. <laughs> we didn't go to a pet store <laughs> yeah, no. and just shove our hand in the thing. Uh, they were... <laughs> they were from a vending machine, okay? They were merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> but she just kicks him out, and he walks out the door, giving her one last stare. He puts up no protest. Yeah. He's like, right, I've overstayed. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> 50 free crickets may have been your limit. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but he gives her that stare and then steve just arrives out of nowhere asking to make plans after work he asks her what's wrong but she tries to tell him only realizing the derelict has disappeared i feel like i would still say something yeah, yeah. she's just like nothing i I'm guess like, we can go yeah. to the movies i don't know yeah i <laughs> <laughs> I thought that too. I was like, why didn't she tell her boyfriend? It still happened. Yeah. And y'all saw him on the street. Yeah. I think that happens too much in movies where that exact moment happens and they're like, oh, it was nothing. Yeah. yeah. No. It was something. Yeah. But say something. Yeah. I think the weird thing for me is that, again, Nay and I talked about how this wasn't one of our childhood films, but in the times I've seen it since, mm -hmm. I genuinely never remember this plot line at all with the derelict. I I remember him, but uh -huh. I didn't remember this happening. Me and uh, me neither. I think Frank is so there's so much going on there that I'm like I don't think there's anything <laughs> else in this movie. It's a one man show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we see Julia returning home with another man for Frank to prey on. The man says that he likes to be careful, but we immediately see him being murdered <laughs> <laughs> and snatched up by yeah. Frank. <laughs> We then see Julia downstairs with a drink waiting for Frank to finish. The camera presses in as we see a small smile spread across her face. And she looks like she's doing some Ziggy Stardust cosplay with the... <laughs> she does. But I'm here for it. I, I don't mind it. But upstairs, Frank, now wearing a shirt and pants, sm <laughs> smokes a celebratory <laughs> cigarette, delighted that he can taste it. I love that he chose to wear clothes, even though he still doesn't have any skin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the thing is, he said his, his nerves were back, so this shirt has yeah. to hurt like hell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's no way that feels good. How or is he not just like, <laughs> <laughs> just screaming the whole time? <laughs> but yeah, it's a fair point. Maybe the air hitting it hurt yeah. worse. Who knows? Maybe. Also, he looks uh, like Escobar from Nip Tuck. He does. At this point, like when he's getting his surgeries and Yes, stuff. I was thinking that, and I was like, well, if they do a remake, they should. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Lasardo. <laughs> He'd be great. Yeah. Julia says that he promised her an explanation, so he shows her the puzzle box, but he tells her not to touch it because it's dangerous. It opens doors, he says, doors to pleasures of heaven or hell. We get a flashback to when he had his little attic seance situation, and we get shots of each of the Cenobites. Butterball Cenobite, played by Simon Bamford. <laughs> Female Cenobite, played by Grace Kirby. And Chattering Cenobite, played by Nicholas Vince. I hate it uh, the chattering one gives me the fucking creeps i hate him but he's my favorite he's no. horrifying <laughs> he's horrifying i guess he's maybe the best one because he got the most visceral reaction from me <laughs> yeah you're like, oh shit <laughs> oh i don't like it they're all pretty cool i like the way really i cool. like the way yeah. all of them look though i did notice and i don't know if they did but like there's a resemblance between him and nemesis from resident evil oh shit and I was like, maybe they used him as like a model for like it or that's something. That's probably Very undeniable. Because cool. yeah. yeah. it even is. Of that. I was like, what? I was like, I know I've seen besides <laughs> from this movie yeah. some, a monster that looks like that. And I was like, it's fucking Nemesis. So yeah, I, like, oh. I think that. They I think were you clearly, hit that. Yeah. 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 You hit that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you nailed it. I hope it. not. I hope not either. <laughs> Damn it. You need to chill. <laughs> this movie's ruining me. <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to point out we talked about the budget a second ago. Right. Another wise choice in budget filmmaking here is hire your friends because most of these people were friends of Clive Barker's. Oh, I love it. From, I guess, when, because he used to direct theater. Right. That's where he actually met Doug Bradley, who, as we said, plays Pinhead. Right. That's so cool. The studio wanted to hire stuntmen to play the Cenobites. And he's like, we need to hire actors. Well, yeah. Because it's not about being physically imposing. Right. It's about these little character moments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he made the smart choice. Oh, no, yeah. But 
Frank says that the Cenobites gave him an experience beyond limits, pain and pleasure indivisible. And that was at that point that I was like, oh, so that's probably why they're dressed like S&M kind of yeah. culture, because that's kind of the melding of the two. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> But we see Frank hanging upside down as the Cenobites, including Pinhead, look on. Hooks sink into him, blood running down him as he spins. But he says that they won't get him back. He says he's going to live and she's going to help him. Julia says that they'll never find him. I'm like, how the fuck do you know? You just learned yeah. <laughs> what Cenobites were like two seconds ago. She, whatever Frank says. It's like, Oh, yeah. yeah. Then, okay, mm-hmm. yes. I agree. But later that night, Larry and Julia watch a boxing match. He remarks that he thought this stuff made her sick, but she says that she's seen worse. It's like, you know what? I like it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You have a club a man with a hammer. But we see Frank upstairs running fucking wind sprints. (laughs) He's being loud as fuck. I don't know what he's doing, but Larry says they can watch something else if she wants. But then he gets way too into the match and it's obvious that he does not want to change the channel. Right. But a storm rages outside. And Frank, again, at full volume, just bangs on the wall and starts screaming. I don't know what he's doing. But Larry's like, what was that? And Julia says that she thinks that she left a window open. Larry says he'll check it out. That's not an explanation. No. no. (laughs) Well, (laughs) it's the best you can think of. It's the monsters outside. Yeah, not in in the attic. Not in the attic. But when Larry says that he'll check it out, she tries to stop him. She says that she hates the thunder and tries to keep him downstairs by kissing him. Larry's like, well, you know, put a bookmark in that, but (laughs) let's check that noise out. She begs him, like begs him not to, but they head up to the attic anyway. See, right here, I was like, he's not a bad dude. No. No. He he offered to change it. He would have... I was like, there's nothing here for me to be like, oh, wow. Well, uh, no. He deserves yeah. it. Yeah. I think he's just boring. Yeah. I think she's just bored. I think that's all that this comes from. But he got her the brandy. He yeah. did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and he turned on the music. She's like, turn on the music. He's like, you got it. Right. Oh, <laughs> like, I mean, I don't know. I don't get it. But he checks the room across the hall and sees nothing. But then he walks into the attic. He looks around, seeing nothing, and attributes the noise to a rat. We see that Frank has nailed a few rats to the wall, which, as if there wasn't enough reason to hate this dude. I know. What did the rats do to deserve that? I don't know. And where do you get the strength? They probably looked at him because he doesn't like that. That's true. I told you not to. (laughs) The funny thing is I read on Mental Floss that a producer had to bring the remote-controlled rats to prove that they weren't harmed in this scene. Well, good. Yes, yeah. I guess the British Board of Film Classification would not allow it to be released until they saw those rats. <laughs> well, uh, good. Like, he fucked those rats yeah, up. Yeah, he did. <laughs> like, we just can't have That's you nailing yeah, rats no. to walls willy-nilly. <laughs> 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 but Larry tells her that there's nothing to be afraid of, and they head to the bedroom. As they kiss, we see something move in front of the camera by the bed. Why does Larry keep whispering to her as they're kissing? Did no, else I, I didn't catch that. <laughs> it's like unintelligible. Yeah, he is. But the, in the hallway and then again in the bedroom, he's like, <laughs> it's like, <I'm> like <laughs> what are you saying? They're sweet nothings, man. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Emphasis on that. But they continue into the room and Larry closes the door behind them. They start making out on the bed and we hear Frank's heartbeat for a second. But Julia looks around and she finds not only her nail polish knocked over, but also a really creepy painting of a boy. I don't know yeah. what that was about. <laughs> why, did, why didn't that end up in the trash? <laughs> but just then, Frank comes bounding out of the closet with his trusty switchblade. Julia straight up says no, begging him not to. Oddly, Larry just keeps going at Julia as Frank heads to the foot of the bed, using his knife to skin a rat like an apple. And it's like making these wet, like ripping sounds. Yeah. And he's acting like he doesn't hear Julia saying, no, please. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what? I'm what so are confused you? here. What's going on? At the very least, if you don't hear the juicy rat, you hear your wife screaming, <laughs> yeah. no, please don't. Yeah, I, I was confused because that went on for a minute. Yes. Yeah, and he's like, just yeah, still going yeah. at it. Still whispering and kissing yeah. her neck. <laughs> Larry. But Julia starts to sob and Frank's like, all right, and just heads back to the closet. (laughs) She got the message. Yeah, she knows what I can do. But Larry finally stops, thankfully, saying he just doesn't understand her and leaves. Sometime later, Larry and Kirsty are having dinner together at a restaurant. 
He wonders if maybe they shouldn't have come here at all, but Kirsty tells him that it's obvious he loves Julia and that there must be something here. He says Julia doesn't even want to leave the house, and it's almost like she's waiting for something. Hmm. (laughs) (laughs) But he asks her if she'll stop by and try to make friends with her, and she agrees. I feel like maybe Larry could try talking to Julia. Yeah. Yeah. And he hasn't. No. He did no. get the brandy. I keep yeah. he did. falling back on that. I feel like he's, he's not doing bad, but he could be like, hey, wife, what the hell's going on? Yeah. What are you waiting for? Instead of, hey, daughter, <laughs> go find out what's wrong yeah. with my... <laughs> Y'all don't like each other, but go well, do this for me. For him, it's two oh, birds yeah. with one stone. He's like, I don't have I to guess. ask her, and I get them to be closer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But back at the house, Frank, bleeding all the way through his best suit, (laughs) says that Julia can't love Larry. She's like, I don't, but still won't allow Frank to drain him. He tells her to find someone else then before the Cenobites come looking for him. You're awfully demanding for a guy with no skin. Yeah, (laughs) You need to chill because you're stuck up here and I'm doing all the work. I literally never have to come back to this attic again. (laughs) (laughs) Bring the tone down is all I'm saying. Who's in the driver's seat? (laughs) (laughs) But in the next scene, she does just that. Unfortunately for her, though, Christy arrives just in time to see her take a man inside. It looked, when she is looking at them going to the house, it looks like the same shot that they used from earlier when she comes to the house the first time. It might have been. I <laughs> think it is. Budget filmmaking. <laughs> I think the thing to me is that she literally checked to make sure the coast was clear like 15 times. Oh, yeah. Didn't see uh, Kirsty's ass standing right in there view. in front of the house, not even I behind a tree. I too. I was like, she's right there. <laughs> you she could have seen hiding. her. No. no. But once inside, the man says that he gets lonely sometimes, which, same. But Julia replies, (laughs) everybody does. (laughs) She invites him into the attic, and he asks if this is a game. Before he can bark, (laughs) (laughs) he notices Frank, with zero decorum, says, Jesus Christ. Well. The first guy was kind of just, he allowed it. Yeah, he did. But this dude's like, that is fucked up. (laughs) (laughs) I don't like any of this. No. You ever see that meme where he's like, sir, this is the scariest moment of my life. (laughs) (laughs) But it is hammer time for victim number three, but he seems more resilient than the others. Frank has to actually grab him and throw him against the wall. And then we see him stick fingers into his neck. So that's how he's draining these guys. Yeah, he went for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But downstairs, Kirsty has finally made it inside the house after a few attempts. The door closes loudly behind her, scaring the absolute shit out of her. As the man upstairs in the attic gurgles, Julia excuses herself from the proceeding. <laughs> it's like, I don't need to see this. Her work here is done. <laughs> Kirsty heads upstairs and Julia hides in the room across from the attic. As she reaches the top floor, the victim, with a sagging purple face covered in blood, rips the door open and reaches out to her asking for help. Looks great. It, oh, yeah. Yeah. Just fantastic work. But Frank leaps out from the room behind the door frame, forcing the guy to the ground. Kirsty is obviously frightened to see him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he tells her that he's Uncle Frank and asks if she remembers him. I love that that was supposed to make the situation better. Yeah, yeah. she's like, <laughs> no, like me, oh, Frank. <laughs> Frank, of course. How, how have you been? <laughs> but he grabs her and says, come to daddy. She screams and gets away from him heading into the attic. That's his niece. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Is he just more of a freak than we even anticipated? Yeah, I think this too much. surpasses freak. Yeah. yeah, it's not good, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly. Right. But he joins her in the attic, slamming the door behind him. She threatens him, and he's like, oh, yeah? What'll you do? What can you do? He tells her there's nothing to be afraid of and corners her. He says he bets her father is proud of her and says that she's beautiful. She says, this isn't happening. And he's like, I used to tell myself that too. (laughs) (laughs) He said that he would tell himself he was dreaming all the pain, but some things must be endured. He says, that's what makes the pleasure so sweet. But she grabs a handful of guts, which causes a tussle. Apparently that was supposed to be worse, but the MPAA is like, you can't can't just get a fistful of guts like that. (laughs) But she knees him in his newly reformed dong. And... (laughs) Then reaches for something to throw at him, grabbing the puzzle box. Things get real serious, and he asks her for it back. She refuses. 
He keeps asking until she's like, you want it? Then fucking have it and throws it out the attic window. She makes her exit as he screams, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm glad that it was like uh, her reaching for a weapon and found it instead yes. of her seeing it and being like, oh, this is what <laughs> yeah. you yeah. What's this? Yeah. She only knew it was something based on his and, reaction. Yeah, yeah. Until he reacted. I agree. Because he chilled out. He's like, okay, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was fun a minute I, Yeah. I take it all back. But on her way out, she picks up the puzzle box and just keeps running. She then replays the scenes that we just saw in her head again. <laughs> and this made me laugh out loud. Yeah. I, there's something about slow motion and echoey repetition that yeah. fucking murders me. Because <laughs> it showed his bloody face and it was like, Kirsty. <laughs> yeah, it also was... just happened. Yes. <laughs> like, we just saw this. But also repeating, come to daddy. Daddy. Yeah. Daddy. I was <laughs> like, what is this? But she walks past a couple of nuns who give her the stink eye. I was going to say judgmental yeah. as fuck. Like, What's, why? I thought that was the whole thing. Judge not. But they're like, who the fuck is no, this? No, they be judging. <laughs> but we get a slow motion shot again of Frank reintroducing himself. <laughs> and we hear sirens wail in the background. She finally stops at a fence and slinks down. People surround her, peering at her and asking if she's all right. We see Frank one more time and then get a shot of a red flower blooming accompanied by his heartbeat. I thought it was pretty neat imagery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in the next scene, Kirsty wakes up in what appears to be a psych ward. It's scary as fuck. It's, I don't know, what, I didn't know <laughs> what kind of facility this is, but I yeah. do not want to be there. Please don't let me wake up there. <laughs> <laughs> but a nurse who, again, clearly has her voice dubbed, says that she'll go get the doctor. The nurse was watching blooming flowers on tv yeah it's, I, it's her favorite show <laughs> what the hell but the doctor finally comes in and she asks what's going on and said that she just wants to call her father he tells her to get back in bed and he'll let her do that later he pulls the puzzle box out of his coat though and asks what it is because he says she was hanging on to it like grim death he then tells her that the police will want to speak to her why i, I don't know she hasn't really done anything and it's not like he got that box from another country it's not like you stole it from yeah, someone no. here <laughs> there's some like merchant that's like that's the box that's and he paid for it a lot exactly. <laughs> too much <Yeah. laughs> well understand <laughs> but he sets the box down on her i guess like meal tray right and he's like maybe the box will jog your memory in the meantime it's like why are you the interrogator yeah. <laughs> oh, but if this is evidence why are you giving it to her and why if are you putting your fingerprints it, on it yeah. it's so important that You're the cops are coming it. yeah i'm so confused i don't by understand this. Once they leave, she tries to open the door to no avail. She then eyes the box. When she picks it up, the TV flashes static and a blooming yellow flower. Music box-like music begins to play as she sits in bed and plays with the box. More poorly rendered pink graphics pop out of the box as it opens. It looked like sperm, right? Eh, towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> But she then gets zapped by blue lightning as the box comes together. A white light, which looks very good, beams out of it. Yeah. I'm wondering if that was done practically and everything else was after. Right. Because it looked in camera. You can, mm -hmm. you can tell the stuff that was Oh, added. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not great. But just then, the walls begin to slide open, revealing a seemingly endless tunnel filled with cobwebs. Kirsty hears a baby crying in the distance, much like in her nightmare, and slowly ventures inside. Babies have no business being in any part no. of no. whatever this is. I don't understand the inclusion of the baby. I don't want to know why they're there. I don't <laughs> get them out. Yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but once inside, we get some very interesting lighting. There's cyan and purple, depending on where the camera is facing. I thought that was neat. But at the end of the hall, Kirsty sees a silhouette. Just as it snaps its head up, we realize it's an absolute monster. Yeah, absolutely not. No. Yeah, you shouldn't I'll, have gone in there. I no. will take my chances with the cops. Well, yeah. And, like, and the flowers, whatever the fuck's whatever going on Whatever questions in here. they have. Yeah, I don't. But this monster has become known as the engineer to fans, I guess. It has cat-like eyes and a long tail that curls up almost like a scorpion. But it moves upside down. And it uses its legs like hands to whip itself down the hall and chase her through the labyrinth in a very odd motion. Yeah. It looks... Very creepy, 
but if you stare too long at yeah. it, you, you see the man in the suit. Yeah. I, was, I was gonna say, I, <laughs> I like the the creature design. I oh, yeah. feel like we just saw a little too much of it. Yes. Yeah. I noticed they use a lot of shadows with Frank, and maybe that's why he's so successfully creepy. Right, right. He looks. He, there's no point where he doesn't look phenomenal. Yeah. But the engineer. Mm. He's just poof, poof, yeah. which is whipping. <laughs> he could have used some shadow, but he growls at her and gnashes like piranha like teeth. Mm-hmm. And luckily, she narrowly escapes him. Was that making the baby noises or was it? Was it like a oh, I mean, crying? Maybe to it was get bait? her. Yeah. yeah. Ooh. Good point. I don't like I, that. I would rather it be that than an actual bit. Ba- I'm upset <laughs> at the thought, <laughs> the thought of a baby of a being baby like, being what is this? <laughs> this is my first memory. <laughs> But once she's back in the room, she sees the wall is just closed again. But she hears the creature moving behind the wall. So I guess it's not a dream. Right. Mm -hmm. She picks up the puzzle box, which shimmers with blue electricity. The TV gives way to static and the lights go out for a moment. The grout in the walls glow in the dark, which looks cool. It does. Yeah. It's just this really subtle thing that just works. Yeah. But we see the flower blooming again on the TV as a bag of fluids next to her bed fills with blood. She runs for the door as the bag explodes, and so does her lamp, and then smoke starts to fill the room. Through a spark of electricity, the chatterer appears, advancing on her and sticking his fingers in her mouth. Yeah. Can you not, please? (laughs) Can you just not do that? Mick Foley's like mandible claw, huh? Yeah. There's a lot of fingers in people's mouths in this movie. What was going on in the 80s? (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I was too small. I don't know. Don't want to know. Don't need to know. But through another spark, Pinhead appears, followed by Butterball. Pinhead says, the box, you opened it, we came. She says it's just a puzzle box, but he says that it's a means of summoning. I just want to shout out, he has a very commanding voice. Yeah. It's great, yeah. It's so fantastic. I couldn't imagine this character without this voice. Mm -hmm. But I read on IMDb that they were originally going to dub him with an American. (laughs) Thank you for not yes. doing like the bad guy can yeah. be. Bad. <laughs> That's pretty tough. I didn't even think That's about ridiculous. that. Ridiculous. But Pinhead tells her they're explorers in the further regions of experience. Demons to some, angels to others. They run the gamut, basically. But to who? Yeah. To who are you angels to? Uh, no well, one I know. <laughs> no. no one I want to know. <laughs> but Kirsty says it was a mistake, and then she tells them to go to hell, which you're not helping <laughs> yeah, in no. your case. Female Cenobite who has her throat torn open, we see. Some fans actually call her deep throat or open throat. I feel like deep throat is a lot easier to say than female Cenobite, so I'm switching. But she says they can't go to hell, not alone. You're like, oh, you fucked up. (laughs) You have fucked up now. (laughs) Pinhead tells her that she solved the box, they came, and now she has to come with them to taste their pleasures. Kirsty begs for them to leave her alone, and Pinhead tells her, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. First of all, great line. <laughs> that, yeah. is, that is a great line. It's horrifying. It is. I think, I, I read on IMDb, originally all the Cenobites were supposed to speak, but the makeup on the Chatterer and Butterball made it impossible for them to speak. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah, there's no yeah, way. Yeah, especially. The Chatterer, he's yes. yeah. through the Chatters. <laughs> but this basically ended up with Pinhead and Deep Throat getting all the great lines. Right. And honestly, according to IMDb and a lot of other writers, they think that the fact that he was given all these lines is why he attained that iconic status. Right. Because they're like, not only does he look scary, he's saying a lot of cool shit. He says all the cool shit, yeah. Before they can take her away, she asks if they've done this before to a man named Frank Cotton. They're like, oh yeah, we did. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I love that their reaction is like, oh, we know Frank. Oh yeah, Yeah. we we go way (laughs) back. (laughs) But she tells them that he escaped them, and they say no one escapes them. But she says, no, he did. I've seen him. (laughs) He's alive. And Pinhead's like, look, even if all that's true, which I'm not saying it is, what does it have to do with you? (laughs) (laughs) She says that she can lead them to him, so she's kind of wanting to make a trade. Deep Throat says, what if we prefer you? She's like, fuck. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't think think about about that. (laughs) Yeah. But Pinhead says that he wants to hear a confession from Frank. Then, maybe. I I love how fair this is. Like, yeah. I'm not going on your word, but if yeah. I hear him say it, then we'll I'm we'll coming see for what's that. Up. 
this kind of leads to something we'll talk about in a bit as far as my view of the Cenobites. Okay. The Cenobites sound like a delicious like Cinnabon, <laughs> like a bite size, but that's not even or there. <laughs> See, I I like this whole scene. Yes. The characters are fantastic. Even like you said, the ones that don't talk. Mm-hmm. They're just uh, so, oh, they're so creepy yeah. looking. Oh, yeah. I like that he's his own character. Mm-hmm. Pinhead. Yes. Yeah. And he's not like just standing there just trying to look menacing or he's whatever. Like he's his own fucking thing. Yes. And it's terrifying. And they're it all is. interesting. And his, yeah, his posse is like, oh shit. <laughs> it's like, posse. You know, they <laughs> are. Yeah. They are. They're like, oh, we rolling out? All yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but this is when he says the greatest line. He says that if she cheats them, we'll tear your soul apart. Yes. I love it. Those stakes are up there. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not fucking with that. No. I'm like, okay, step one, get Frank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But back in the attic, Julia and Frank assume that Kirsty has, quote, told them everything. I assume she meant the police and not the Cenobites. Right. Because she doesn't even know any of that shit. Right. Yeah. But the phone rings and Julia wonders if it's Kirsty or the police. Frank can't be arsed. <laughs> She's like, you don't care? He's like, what I care about is getting me a yeah. new skin. <laughs> Frank has a one track mind and it's the funniest thing in the world to me. Police, I don't, I don't give care. a fuck. My, my, everything's bumping. My nerve endings are exposed. Yeah. <laughs> she says they should just leave and he's basically like, have you forgotten I'm a monster? Like, hello. Yeah. But Frank says Larry will be home soon and they kind of just look at each other. A short time later, Larry arrives home. Julia stands on the stairs, switching on the light, and he asks her what's going on. She says she doesn't know where to begin, and that it's best if he just sees it for himself. I'm going to go to the store. <laughs> 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 Nothing about the way she said that would make me want to go yeah. up those stairs. Everyone's so oblivious to her intentions. All right. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll check it out. Back at the ward, Steve is there to check on Kirsty, but she's not there. As the nurse leaves, he wonders if she's gone back to her father's house. Now it's her father. Yeah. <laughs> she went back to Larry's yeah. house. But back at her father's house, we see a man head downstairs, cracking his knuckles. He heads into the room where Julia is, and when he caresses her face, we see Larry's bandage from when he cut himself earlier. Mm-hmm. But he leaves a trail of blood where he touched her cheek. I think we can all assume what happened. Yes. Frank has successfully reskinned himself. Yeah. Yes. Larry got got. Larry got got. Yeah. And now he's wearing him. But wasting no time, they bang. I mean, that's what this whole thing has been foreplay for Julia yeah. up until this moment. She's like, fine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but Kirsty arrives shortly after, pounding on the door, calling out for her father. Julia answers the door, asking what's wrong. Kirsty says that she wants to see her father. Julia's like, of course, which would make me very suspicious. Yes. Oh, yeah. But we see what appears to be Larry seated at the mirror, drink in hand. Dad, why are you all bloody around the edges? Don't ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> he, was. <laughs> he was. She rushed. Don't you question your father. I thought that too. I was like, you don't notice his fucked up hairline? <laughs> what? I was like, <laughs> was she that like anxious to see him? Yeah. And she's like, well, that looks I like my that. dad. That's it's fine. close enough. <laughs> But she rushes up and hugs him, glad to see him alive. She says that she needs to talk to him. And we do notice his ear does not look quite no. right. No. And there is blood all over that hairline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's like, I just got hair plugs five minutes yeah. ago. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but Kirsty tells him everything about Frank being upstairs and that he's trying to kill him. Not Larry says whatever Frank did was unspeakable. But it's finished now because he's gone. I think that is... In all fairness, my major problem with the film is that just because Frank is wearing Larry's skin doesn't mean he'll sound like Larry. I agree. Yeah, I yeah. noticed that too. I was like, why does he sound like him now? He, he also took his voice box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I understand if he doesn't sound like Larry, then Kirsty would know right away. Yeah. But, but that is not... That's at least, not reason like, enough. Just yeah. try to make him change his voice to sound like he's trying, or like he's yes. trying to impersonate. It is him. his brother. Yeah. Like maybe but- try to, you know. Yeah, you yeah. and I overlap. Yeah. So you're telling me these guys can't? Well, one of them's British, so maybe. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in the novella they said that his voice was gruffer. Yeah. And the actor who plays Larry doesn't even. He's just Larry. He's like, I'm fine, Kirsten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Julia says that Frank is dead. And not Larry, says Frank was a mad dog who had to be put out of his misery. 
He says when he's feeling better, he'll go to the police and try to explain everything. He asks Kirsty if Frank hurt her, but she says she's okay. He says Frank is better off dead, but Kirsty won't believe it until she sees it. Not Larry tells Julia to show her. As they leave, Not Larry smiles, admiring himself in the mirror. Then he starts fucking with his eye a little bit. Yeah, I didn't appreciate it. No, yeah. like, <laughs> you can stop at any time. It like crunches. It it's does. too much. But upstairs in the attic, Kirsty sees a skinless corpse on the ground. As she gasps at the sight, Julia closes the door behind her. Kirsty tries to leave, but suddenly the Cenobites are back. They say they want the man who did this, pointing down at the bloody skeletal remains that are now surrounded by candles. Did you notice that? Yeah. Yes, out of nowhere. Did they do that, like, in his memory? Out of respect. <laughs> <laughs> but Kirsty's like, that wasn't part of the deal, Blackheart. <laughs> and she says that the man who did this is her father, and they can't have him. Well, don't yeah, tell don't, him that. Yeah. Yeah. It's Larry Cotton. <laughs> I mean, oh, shit. <laughs> He's right downstairs. <laughs> But she escapes out of the attic and runs downstairs. I thought that Julia locked the door, but she just whips it open yeah. and leaves. She did. Hmm. Did she? She did. Oh. I don't see why she would just shut <laughs> her in there. He's like, oh, damn it. <laughs> but once Kirsty gets down the stairs, she sees that Julia is blocking the stairway. She gets in a very short-lived tussle and yeah. just gets right <laughs> past her. I don't get that. But she tells not Larry that they have to leave. But he tells her to stay and that they can all be happy here. He then says, come to daddy. And she finally realizes not Larry is Isn't Frank. <laughs> <laughs> he touches her face and she responds by scratching a very deep wound oh, into yeah. his uh, cheek. Well, I'd be like, Pinhead, guys, he's down here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's funny to me because Julia just screams, Frank! And it's like, I guess the jig is up. Yeah. <laughs> just completely. But Frank feels his cheek, which is torn to ribbons and looks like great. flaps, yeah. It looks really good. The flaps keep moving for the rest of the, yeah. <laughs> the movie. But he pulls his standard switchblade and says, so much for the cat and mouse shit, which they really weren't. No. Because yeah. <laughs> we're not doing a good no. job. As Julia holds Kirsty, Frank advances slowly. He goes to stab her, but she jumps right out of the way just in time, and he stabs Julia in the stomach. <laughs> How Shakespearean. Yeah. yeah. She literally screams, not me! <laughs> <laughs> Which is, yeah. Hilarious. <laughs> he sinks his fingers into her neck, though, draining her, telling her it's nothing personal. Waste not, want not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He did not give a fuck about her. No. No. It's really not fair. It's not. And I, I wish we were talking a little bit about this earlier, even though we were trying not to. <laughs> she deserved a better ending. Yes. To me. Yeah. Because I know that the lead is obviously Frank. And I mean, is it? I don't know. But <laughs> I feel like none of this would have gone into motion if not for Julia. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel like it was kind of a rush to, oh, we got to get her out of the way because we got to get to the finale. Yeah. That's kind of what it felt like. No, I agree. All right. Not only do I agree that her death is underwhelming, I feel like her character has such depth. At the point where Kirsty sees her sneaking the man into the house, that's when we kind of switch protagonists. You're right, yeah. And I feel like Julia is a infinitely more interesting protagonist. She is. Oh, yeah. And I don't, I like the aspect of, oh, she did all this. Like, she risked it, risked it all oh, yeah. right. for him for that, for that moment to come and him be like, Later, bitch. <laughs> like, I like that aspect of it because uh -huh. he didn't give a fuck about you ever. No. No. So it's kind of like she got her comeuppance in that way. I just right. wish the death was a little more meaningful, if that makes sense. It's underwhelming. It is. I mean, that could have happened to like the nurse that we saw for two seconds. Uh -huh. It's like, oh, shit. Like, Julia deserved a more right. dramatic. Her face does look cool when she's drained, though. It does. Yeah. I will give her that. Still not worth it, though. <laughs> <laughs> but Frank pulls his knife out from her stomach and she just sinks to the floor he turns around his face is still fucked up though i'm like i guess it takes time yeah <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but kirsty hides in the room adjacent to the attic and frank isn't far behind she goes to hide in a dresser but some kind of buddy christ statue pops out <laughs> yeah I, <laughs> and it's a like a lot of weird shit in there yeah i thought you got rid of all this stuff oh yeah i guess they just well we want to keep this one i don't yeah. <laughs> I, I don't really understand is that Frank stuff? I think so. Yeah, I don't get I think, why it was there in the first so. place. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But Buddy Christ is like, seats taken. So <laughs> she just hides behind some furniture. Frank enters the room and it's dead silent. 
Kirsty continues crawling behind the furniture, but suddenly the corpse of the first man that Julia brought home just lurches forward, maggots spilling out of his mouth all over her. She somehow does not scream, and Frank just leaves the room. He's like, nothing nothing in here but us corpses. Yeah. <laughs> But she cautiously opens the door and just sobs at the banister. Behind her, the door to the attic opens and Frank just walks out. He snaps his switchblade at her and she recedes into the attic, tripping over her father's skinless corpse. She cries for her father, but Frank tells her not to mourn him. He tells her everything's all right and that her dear old Uncle Frank is here. (laughs) He's like, it's me, your uncle, Frank Cotton, the last part of my socialist. (laughs) He did, though. So we didn't need all that. Chill no. out, dude. He literally tried this a second ago, yeah, too, and it didn't work. It didn't work. At all. But just then, blue light begins to peer through the attic windows and the slits in the walls. The light then reveals each of the Cenobites. The chains and the spinning pillars from the beginning return, and we get a real tight shot of the Chatterer living up to his name. Gotcha, bitch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He blocks the door when Frank tries the bail and just, like, pushes him. <laughs> He's like, uh-uh, no. not gonna happen. But Frank backs away from him and Pinhead flat out calls him Frank. And he's like, no, (laughs) not me. I'm Larry. (laughs) Don't look at the skin. (laughs) See my skin? Yeah. But Deep Throat tells him that they had to hear it from his own lips. Pinhead tells Kirsty, this isn't for your eyes. And Frank's like, you set me up, bitch. (laughs) Frank tries to advance on Kirsty with the knife yet again, but a hook snags his hand when he tries to stab her, pulling him back. Another hook snags into his other hand, and he's almost like crucified right. yeah. in a way. I just have to quickly insert, again, I love how fair they are. They're oh, yeah. not going uh, up a hearsay. Mm-mm. Motherfucker, we heard you oh, yeah. say your yes. Uncle Frank. <laughs> and if he wouldn't have been a dick, then... Yeah. He would have gotten away with yeah. it, too, if it wasn't for... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that's, I think that's my thing about the Cenobites that I said I wanted to bring up later. I don't know that I see them as villains because... They're just doing their own no, thing, yeah. to be honest. You fucked with the box. Yeah. Y- y- we're here now. Yeah. We didn't start any of this. Right. We're finishing it, though. Yeah, they didn't start the fire. <laughs> no. It's, it's always burning <laughs> since the world's been turning. But Frank looks around at the Cenobites as dozens of more hooks find purchase all over his body including several pulling at the skin on his new face. Frank licks his tongue seductively at Kirsty and says, Jesus wept, and then he starts to chuckle. I read that the line was supposed to be, fuck you. Uh Uh-huh. That's a little less eloquent. (laughs) That's what (laughs) Clive Barker had written. But Andrew Robinson convinced him to change the line to Jesus wept. And I think it works a lot better. (laughs) I'm glad. That would have just been weird. (laughs) Oh, wow. But Kirsty bails out of the room just as Frank is torn apart, exploding in a mist of blood. And again, according to IMDb, this was a lot more gruesome before. Mm -hmm. But the question is, did he have time to come on the floor? (laughs) (laughs) Can he come back? His arms were <laughs> separate, so I don't I don't think so. Not this time. <laughs> but Kirsty runs downstairs and Deep Throat meets her halfway, scraping at the wall, which bleeds. She runs into the bedroom where she finds Julia lying in bed, holding the puzzle box, her face completely skinned. She's finally able to get it out of Julia's death grip and fiddles with it, backing away from Deep Throat. Pinhead rises up behind her and says, We have such sights to show you. She goes, oh, shit, which <laughs> I love so much because yeah. that's what I would say. Well, no, yes. yeah. I mean, <laughs> what else is there? to Yeah. Say? <laughs> but she starts messing with the box again and Pinhead tells her not to. She tells him to go to hell, putting the box back together for a puzzle box. Mm hmm. Every single time this has been surprisingly easy to solve. It, no. You just put a few pieces together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you don't want to solve it, though. No. no. Well, okay, so here's my question. When Frank solves it, he gets torn apart. But when she solves it, she gets rid of the Cenobites. Do you have to solve it twice? Is that what it is? Well, it did. They is did. It like the COVID vaccine? Did, <laughs> <laughs> you need two? Two doses. <laughs> um, it did look like it was a different shape when Frank did it. Ver- right. Maybe like mm. the way you twist it. Maybe it he does didn't different solve it. Things. Like he, well, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to figure it out, but... <laughs> Pinhead, after she solves it, is suddenly covered in really odd-looking yellow light before he explodes. 
Yeah. I mean, for the <laughs> for a movie whose effects were so fantastic, mm-hmm. the whole film, that was a little, I was like, we could have done a, a little well, more. I'm sure they ran out of money. I read, oh, yeah. Yeah. I read that that's what happened. Apparently, Clive Barker said that they did this yellow bit in a weekend. Oh, oh man. Shit. <laughs> he says he personally, along with some other guy, drew it frame by frame. Wow. I mean... I mean, it looks awful, no, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look great. But everything else was so fantastic, yeah. like so phenomenal that all it encompasses, I'll let it slide. Right. I think that's the issue is that everything else looked so good before. Yeah. That this is like, what the fuck? I, <laughs> what I, am I watching? <laughs> yeah. This Power Rangers? <laughs> I didn't take it that they were like dying or anything. I took it like they were going back in the box. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you said they exploded. So I didn't know if you were saying like maybe. That's what they, I was. They, yeah. Because Pinhead explodes and then you see his body fly off at a door. But I'm like, I don't. They're not dead. <laughs> yeah. So I was I was also confused yeah. by that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but Kirsty rinse lathers and repeats the same thing with Deep Throat. Yes. And she's also bathed in a yellow death as well. Just then, Steve knocks on the front door, letting himself inside. Kirsty runs downstairs as the house begins to collapse around her. She then comes face to face with the chatterer who is wearing a veil (laughs) for some reason. He got into Julia's wedding stuff. I guess. (laughs) That made me laugh. It's like always the bridesmaid, never. (laughs) He's like, fuck that. We're doing it today. (laughs) But he takes it off and she hits him over the head with the puzzle box. She then brings it back together, which sends him to a yellow hell as well. She's relieved to see Steve, but Butterball appears behind him with a knife at the ready. He's just going old school. He's like, I don't need it. Fuck this. Yeah, screw the chains. Here's a blade. But luckily, he's crushed by falling debris. Kirsty and Steve embrace, and he says that they should get the hell out of here. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Obvious. But before they can, the box starts moving on its own. Steve opens the front door against Kirsty's protest, but nothing happens, and they smile for a moment. They're like, whew, that could have been real bad. (laughs) But suddenly, the engineer rears his ugly head through the darkness. Steve <laughs> breaks a bottle over its head, but then he gets sucked in the mouth for his efforts. <laughs> I love I, that. It just punches yeah, him in the face. I, I wrote that too. I was like, it, out of all the things, <laughs> you just punch this dude in the face. Good they're, old fashioned. Yeah. They're starting to lose their magic, I guess. <laughs> right. But in a struggle, Kirsty is able to grab the box, put it back together, and make with the yellow to vanquish it. They stand up and make their way out of the house. The front door closes on its own behind them, and Steve wraps his jacket around Kirsty. We see all the lights in the house come on, or so we think, but it's really a fire that's beginning to rage. We then see Frank's photo burn in a very tight shot. Kirsty then throws the puzzle box into the burning debris of the house, I guess. It's clearly a different set. Oh, yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. This is, <laughs> it's like, let's film the end in the junkyard, but we'll pretend <laughs> it's the house burning down. <laughs> But suddenly, the derelict returns, walking through the flames to retrieve the box. He is absolutely covered in flames, but he transforms into a winged skeletal creature and flies away. May I please have a crumb of explanation? (laughs) I can't help you. What? Maybe he's taking the box back to where it belonged or like, I mean, obviously they're not dead. Right. Right. So maybe it was a creature from the Leviathan coming to take the box back. Maybe. Or, I, I, I mean, understand I don't know. that, but I, why was he following Kirsty and early, not Julia? Early. Well, she was having nightmares too mm. before everything had happened. Mm. What if he had already knew? What if he was outside the window just beaming the nightmares into her head? Oh, there you <laughs> <I> go. Mean, <laughs> Eyes rolled back. <laughs> <laughs> Eating crickets? <laughs> yes, exactly. By the hand, just flicking them up. But <laughs> we then star wipe through the eye of the box. <laughs> Back to the merchant at the beginning in Morocco. The box sits on that same table, and the merchant asks a man, what's your pleasure, sir? And then the credits roll. So, what did you guys think of Hellraiser? Uh, I I still like this movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, like your sister said, I feel like it's underrated. I feel like not enough people talk about it. And I know we, the three of us talked about it before mm-hmm. we sat down to record the episode, but... I do like this. Yeah, it's got some visual problems here and there, <laughs> but I I feel like this movie isn't talked about enough or the character or anything. Mm-mm. And I feel like it should. You know, he's not a stereotypical slasher or, or you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or like he's not a, uh, just cracking jokes and saying dumb shit. 
Like I, I enjoyed how this movie was made and the monsters and everything. Like I thought it was really good. Mm-hmm. I agree with basically everything you just said. I don't know why it's not brought up in yeah, conversation. I, um, I really did appreciate it watching it this time. I love the Cenobites. They're mm-hmm. so good and creepy. Mm-hmm. Um, the end feels a little bit rushed right. for me. Yeah. And I don't like how easily she's able to kind of contain them oh, back. Yeah. There's, I mean, a couple nitpicky things like that, but very original story, mm-hmm. very original creatures and characters. And I know we, t- we talked a little bit about, you know, the sketchiness right. of the light <laughs> at the end, but Frank, man, he's up there with, oh, with yeah. some of the mm-hmm. best practical effects to me. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a really good, movie that does not get its due i think i i will agree i think the thing to appreciate the most aside from a lot of the practical effects is the story oh yeah i think that the only issue i have with it though is that i want more of the lore in this film yes yes like, yeah, because don't I don't remember any of the sequels, but I know you said that it gets more defined. It does. Like the the next two aren't bad, mm-hmm. and we do get like a pinhead origin story. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. Because now this is just kind of like okay. And yeah, that, that that was something too. Watching this movie again as an adult, I'm like, I want more. Yeah. I wish yeah. this movie was just a little longer. And more, give me more detail, flesh some more stuff out. Let's. Get... I was gonna say for how short it yes. is, we had time. We had oh, the no, time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It goes to kind of what we were talking about before we started recording, which is I don't think that they had sequels in mind. Right. It, do- no, it doesn't yeah. feel like I, it. I can. I can see that. I mean, you can see at the end we've kind of got a cyclical thing going. Uh-huh. Right. Um, but. I feel like that's within the context of this. Yes. I don't feel like that was a spinoff kind of a right, moment. Right. It seems like that's just them saying that this is always going to be. Yeah. yeah. Which is honestly, I like that aspect of the ending. I do too. I, I really, really like that last shot of, oh, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. oh, this is happening again. And the dude's obviously, you know, because he told Frank, it always was yours. You know yeah. what I mean? Like. He's in on whatever the fuck's and going on. And what's your on. deal? Yeah, yeah. Who are you? <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. I like, I like that a lot. Kind of getting us there. Uh, for mm-hmm. me, it's a little rocky. I, I, oh, yeah. I want that stuff fleshed out. Mm-hmm. Who's the merchant? How did Frank hear about this box? Who's the derelict? Who's the, yes. Yeah. Is he from Indigo Prophecy? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I but, think you nailed it. Yeah, there we go. But I mean, and also for me, I think Julia does, just deserves better. She is, I feel like she should be mentioned among the women in horror. And oh, she's yeah. not. No. She's not at all. Her character is so intriguing and like dark. Oh, right. Yeah. She's a joy to watch. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yes. But I guess that brings us to ratings and I'll go first. I did want to bring up something that we didn't necessarily discuss completely. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is kind of... It's not perfect, obviously, but straight up a love story. Mm -hmm. It is a very dark one. Yeah, (laughs) to say it. Yeah, (laughs) the thing for me is that I think with the inclusion of the character Steve, you kind of get three kinds of love in this movie. With Steve and Kirsty, you get like I guess the true love, if you will. Mm -hmm. He he rushed to save her. They escaped together happily. Right. With Larry and Julia, you get this idea of unrequited love. Yeah. He loves her, but she's not feeling it. Mm-hmm. But she loves this guy right here. <laughs> exactly. And then with Frank and Julia, you just get flat out lust. Yeah. And so I think that it's an interesting way to show all these facets of the same basic emotion. Right. That's a really good point. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I that's one thing that wasn't really dealt with in the novella, I don't think. No. I mean, you get the unrequitedness with Larry and Julia. Uh-huh. And but- you get the lust. But that idea but of, you know. There is no, no. good example of <laughs> It's of all love. dark. Yeah. <laughs> but not to repeat everything I said, I think the effects in this movie are very good for most of it. And then it starts to get a little uh, cheap. <laughs> Put it that way at the end. But I think with what they were able to do with this small budget, the, the fact that he, Clive Barker, got to put his vision on screen. Yeah. yeah. Even with the cuts from the MPAA, 
it's probably as close as can be without an X rating. Right. Because the novella gets a little, as you as we hinted. <laughs> <It's a lot. laughs> yeah, it gets a little blue. But definitely agree with you that Julia needs to be talked about more. Yeah. Would have been a little more interesting to me if she had remained the protagonist and would have been a lot more interesting to me if we got some more of that lore. Oh, yes. yeah. No, yeah. yeah. And some of these questions answered. But out of 10 painfully pleasurable puzzle boxes, <laughs> I'm going to give Hellraiser seven painfully pleasurable puzzle boxes out of 10. Say that 10 times fast. Please, I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> but I will now open the floor. So I really enjoyed this movie. And like I, you know, we said at the very beginning, I did watch it as a kid and I didn't understand a lot of it. And then the older I got, the more I kind of pieced together and I kind of understood a little more and more. Mm -hmm. And then watching it now, like as a, a an adult, I'm like, this is this is great. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't understand why no one's talking about yeah. Pinhead the way they talk about Jason or about Michael Myers or Freddie or it's like, how is this character not bigger than what it should be? It's like you said, the lore, like mm -hmm. if you get in and dig deep into the Leviathan and where they're, who they are, like they were people before this. And that's very interesting. Yeah, what? They were people who got played with the box and now this is them. <gasps> this is their reality. So, I want to know what that is. So do and we, is that the second one? Do we get into that? Uh, the second one, I think the mom comes back. Oh, shit. And it's, well, I mean, I'm. I'm going to dive more into right, this I'm sure we're going to cover I, it. I know they're not uh -huh. all but, yeah. great, but I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I, like I said, I feel like the first three are fine. And okay. Anything after that. Not so yeah. much. Off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I do. For everything that we've already said, I do enjoy this movie a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, the story, everything, how it is, the lore, the the character designs, how they are. And it's it's good to see a villain, if that's what you could call them, right? Uh, portrayed this way. You know yeah. what I mean? And I am very much looking forward to covering more of these movies in the series. For sure. Um. On a scale from one to ten, painfully pleasurable puzzle boxes. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give this movie eight of those pleasurable puzzle boxes. Very good. I Like I said, again, it might just be because I watched it a lot as a kid and then growing up and whatever. But I still feel like this character can can be a lot. Right. Like all four of them. And even who's to say you can't add more characters to the series. Right. If they were able to be sucked in mm -hmm. and then whatever they did to be turned into these monsters yeah. or whatever they are, demon, angel, whatever, who's to say you can't create a new one? Seriously, it's the implication. Yeah. I mean, it's there. Like, yeah. You have the story. You have the material. Give us more, please, hmm. please. <laughs> <laughs> Just not bad. Not, yeah, no. yeah, not bad stuff. Only good. Not made in a weekend in the backyard. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I was surprised at how much I enjoyed this this right. time around. Uh, I think, I mean, I've already touched on the stuff that I didn't really care for, like uh, how they handled Julia at right. the end. But up until then, I really loved how they... Like she was badass in mm -hmm. like the worst way. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And they weren't precious with her. Like she got her hands dirty. Yeah, mm -hmm. it like affected her or whatever, but she was she didn't give a fuck. She was no. like, No, this is my dude <laughs> mm -hmm. and I'm riding for him. And I'm gonna get him some skin. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get this motherfucker some skin. <laughs> I just I really like it. And the lore we've already talked about. Um I feel like, and I just, I couldn't get enough of looking at Frank because he was so disgusting. Oh, yeah. Like, you almost don't want to look at him, but right. you can't help it. Don't look at me. Yeah. <laughs> he even tells you. Yeah. He's like, look, I know. I'm it's gross. It's a dare. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess I don't really need to rehash, you know, the pros and cons that I feel about this movie. But uh, I agree with you, John Paul. All right. On a scale from one to 10, painfully pleasurable. Puzzle boxes, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. You got it. I also give this eight out of ten. Because right. I, I was really I was really, really impressed. No, yeah. The areas that 
There's some areas that oh, need yeah. a little work, but <laughs> I, it was for me overshadowed by such a really unique and weird story mm-hmm. and universe that they built. Especially really, at the time. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> I read, I can't remember exactly what the project is, but they are working on some form of a reboot of Hellraiser. Don't fuck it up. Well, Clive yeah. Barker is supposed to be at the helm. He okay. better be. Okay. So, he better be. Because we've seen that great value, Pinhead, and that <laughs> shit is <laughs> not good. Put it back. Yeah. Well, that's all from us at Podmortem. What would you rate Hellraiser and what should we watch next? Let us know on Twitter at the Podmortem. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook. Be sure to follow each of us on Twitter at TravisMWH, at Blood and Smoke, and at RealStreeter84. Please consider pledging to our Patreon and stay tuned until after the music for a special thank you to our Windigo Getter patrons. And remember, while love can be as complicated as a puzzle, sometimes it's only skin deep. Until next time. Thank you for staying tuned. We want to give a special shout out to our Wendigo Getter patrons. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all fired up over yeah. here. Oh, yeah. Special thank you to Chris Ontiveros, Kristen Lofton, Megan Martinez, Kimberly Bass, Melanie Van Husten, Sophie Hodson, Anthony Jerome M., Jordan Nash, Kent and Allison Morton, Guy54, Lala Thomas, Travis and Nisa Hunter, Miguel Myers ATX, Mandy, Jennifer Perez, and Pierre Lombard. Thank you all so much. Each and every one of you. Yes, thank thank you. you. We realized that if we didn't recognize you for your support, we would all be real pinheads. <laughs> <laughs> like the antagonist. Yes, yeah. he was yeah. the lead Cenobite. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I like that guy. Oh, he's great. Yeah. Same. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>